Well, hello, and welcome to the Battle Line Podcast, where we have conversations on the collision and that space between community, faith, and culture. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Satterley, and here with me is my host and co-host in life, Jamie Satterley, editor of Peer Magazine. Hey. We also have with us here uh, today our co-host and producer, the one who really, again, makes this entire show run, Elizabeth. How are you doing today, Elizabeth? I am so super full. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Listen, I am freezing. I'm glad it's not snowing here like it is. And for our guests today, they'll probably be like, oh, you big wimp. Uh, but I, I cannot, I cannot get warm. It is awful. All right, let's let's jump in. Let's get off this topic. Jump right in. Uh, today's episode, we're so excited. We have our very first interview on the Battle Line podcast. Hey. Uh, yeah, we have with us today Captains Jay uh, and Leslie Nags. They are the Territorial Youth Secretaries in the Eastern Territory. For those of you who may not be familiar with Salvation Army structure, uh, we kind of in the states divide up into four regions uh, for administrative purposes. And so the eastern is the one in the northeast. We'll let them tell us a little bit about that um, later. But basically, the NAGs are responsible for all youth program- programming that happens there in the Eastern Territory. So, you know, uh, if you've been with us in the battle line, you know we aim to deal with faith and culture conversations uh, that uh, affect millennials and Gen Z, um, things that they battle daily. And and what better way for us to explore these conversations than getting right to the leaders who interact in these areas the most. So big shout out, big welcome to uh, Captains Jay and Leslie Nags. Welcome, right. guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Jay and Leslie, first question. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Let the people out there know you. What are your responsibilities in the Eastern Territory? And for those who, again, listen to this, who don't know much about the United States or know much about the Salvation Army in the United States, what when we say Eastern Territory, what does that mean? Sure. So Jay and I have uh, been married for almost 20 years, and I'm much too young for that to be real, real, (laughs) but it is. Um. But uh, Jay and I have three kiddos. Uh, We have been Salvation Army Corps officers, which is uh, local uh, uh, leaders, pastors in the local Salvation Army Corps. Um, And now for the last 10-ish, I can't think, but somewhere around 10 years, we've been um, in youth ministry. So it has been our joy to do that. And uh, in the Salvation Army, uh, we are broken, um, as Jamie said, into four sections. We're in the northeast of the United States. So we go from Maine down to the very tip of uh, northeastern Kentucky is sort of what um, the eastern territory is and sort of how we uh, can support Salvation Army youth ministry in the northeast of the United States. And Puerto Rico. Don't forget about Puerto Rico. Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. How could I? That's where I want to be right now, by the way. But yes, <laughs> our our friends in Puerto Rico as well. How well often, just a follow-up question, how often do you get to go to Puerto Rico? Well, we'll, we'll typically go um, for an annual visit to go support their youth councils, which is their annual, you know, middle school, high school uh weekend where they get together down there and we'll go down there and provide support that way. Leslie and I do not speak Spanish very well. So <laughs> our, our support really comes in the form of prayer and uh, pom pom. <laughs> uh, but they uh, will, we'll get on there once a year to be supportive and they got, there's some great stuff going down there. As a matter of fact, I would say some of like the most uh, exciting uh, energy, like uh, most, like the, the biggest hope I have right now in young adults is down in Puerto Rico. They have a great group and they've been working with folks down there. And every time they can come to anything or be a part of anything here in the lower 48 or whatever we're called up here, or I don't know, whatever they call us, <laughs> uh, whenever they can come, we try to bring as many as possible because they just, they like to worship. They like to have fun. And, um, you know, we're just really, we're really thankful that we have such a strong relationship with Puerto Rico. That's awesome. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about like, what does it mean when we say you're in charge of, of all youth stuff? Like, what does it mean to be a youth secretary? Well, I would say that we're not in charge of very much. (laughs) 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 No, what we're, what we're responsible for, I think is providing resource and support to the great work that's taking place in our territory. So, the core take care of the kids that are right there in their neighborhoods. And then 
those core are subgrouped into divisions. And then there's someone who focuses on the youth there and really helping training those people. So we try to provide resources for those that are training other leaders. And we really try to encourage people, you know, individually and, you know, see the potential in them and uh, try to be a lot of fun and, you know, add to what they're doing locally. Right. Right. That's good. So like, I, I appreciate your heart for this, having known you off and on for a little bit. We've run into each other in some paths and then getting to know you um, these past couple of months. We're all youth people uh, in the youth game, youth guys, I guess. Uh, and so I tell me a funny camp memory, funny something like what's the funniest thing that's happened to you in youth work? That is such a loaded question and very <laughs> difficult to answer because there is just so much stuff. Um as I was thinking about this, um, we have one particular story, but I am not a storyteller. That is Jay's job. So Jay <laughs> is going to tell you about a fantastic group of kids from the Jaguar cabin um, in one of our uh, camps here in the Eastern Territory. The fact that you name your cabin, sorry, Jay, after like animals, that's spicy. Oh, right? We got like, the, it's, we got it's the not, bears. It's, Oh yeah, it's not, bore, it's not boring like one A, two C, or whatever. We have the Jaguar cabin, boy. Yes. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the Jaguar cabin is sort of the middle of the the camper population age group. So, like, we're thinking like nine, ten. All right, that's important because <laughs> the story is pretty unbelievable. So, the Jaguar cabin. This night we will entire entitle the Crazy Eight. Okay, <laughs> this is what happened. There was a nice crowd of kids in the cabin and two of our seasoned counselors who we love very, very much, but are characters in their own right. You know what I'm trying to say? Yes, They're both yes. very funny. They're both a little bit like silly. And sometimes you kind of question exactly what they're up to. Does that make sense? They're just a little bit like odd. But anyway, they love children. They love the Lord and they're fantastic. And we believe in safety at camp, of course. Anyway, these two counselors. <laughs> disclaimer. As a disclaimer. Right. It's absolutely true. But these kids one night decided they were going to break out of the cabin. <laughs> and eight children left the cabin and went all the way down to our candy store. So like every day the kids get canteen. They right. broke into the candy store and looted the place. They brought... <laughs> like the empty pillowcases and they emptied the entire place of all of its candy. Then they went back to the cabin unnoticed by the counselor. <laughs> the counselor had no idea. They look in there and the kids are kind of making noises and snickering, kind of laughing. And you know, like when you're watching kids and they're that kind of happy, something bad is happening. <laughs> <laughs> so the counselor's like, come on guys, you got to get out of bed. And one of the kids would not get out of bed. So he pulls the covers and underneath the covers was like a pile of candies totally surrounding his body. <laughs> All of, he was laying in a bed, a mattress of candy. And then they start looking and there is hundreds of dollars of candy now stolen <laughs> in this thing. Okay. So the, the, this happens. Of course, the counselors tell, the, they go through the whole process. It finally comes now time for interrogation. And if you're a camp director, you definitely have to, you know, refine your inter interrogation skills. So we sit these kids down. And then, of course, you go through your typical social dynamics. Who looks like the ringleader? You know what I mean? <laughs> Who looks like they're strong enough to get into the play? And, like, you Sizing have to, them up. Sizing right, you them like, up. You have to figure them out. So we bring in, I, we decided to bring in the kid who's like closest to us and happen to be the smallest one of all of them. We interview him. We're like, so what happened? Whose idea? He's like, I don't know. They just told me to do it. So we're like, okay, that makes sense. Smallest kid just kind of following along. <laughs> and the rest of the kids, they all pointed the finger back to the first kid <laughs> who organized the whole thing. Oh, he showed man. up on day one with this plan to loot the canteen, got everybody involved. <laughs> They stole all this candy. It was fantastic. And these two counselors will never live it down. As a matter of fact, they made it into the end of summer video and there was like a retelling of it, like a like a true crime type story with the fictitious plot lines that we all had a lot of fun with. But nobody got hurt. The kids all went home. You know what I'm saying? But nobody yeah. got hurt. Uh, and they had a fun they had a good time, good memory. And the rest of us, you know, will laugh about it forever because it's crazy. For sure. We ran the, ran the camp that night. <laughs> 
<laughs> this was clearly a boy who had been to camp for a few years and had been thinking about this because what Jay left out is this was opening night. Like the kids had got there that morning. Oh my! Gosh. And my guy, I think, had been planning for eleven months what he was going to do, he and so he did it. He was so small. I don't know how he got in the window. I mean, they must have picked him up and threw him in. Because you know, like the nine, ten-year-olds, they, they, they like the difference in weight is like two hundred pounds. You know what I'm saying? Like some of them are three feet, some of them are eight feet. Like it's anyway. The littlest guy could. I don't know. Anyway, it was it was remarkable. We laugh about it all the time. Oh man, and that's so it's something good. that kind of brought the staff together because it was so ridiculous. And thankfully, nobody got hurt. You For know sure. what I mean? And. Uh, yeah. From then on, there were belts on the door so that people knew if the door <laughs> opened. <laughs> you should have named the candy store after him after that. But like, this is like the Jaguar, the, the Jaguar right. canteen. That's right. Uh, there's no life like camp life. That's a, life. That was an 11-month case job. That's yes, right. yes, yes. So good. Well, and why we're, we should we should say you should go work at camp. <laughs> all, you, all you teenagers right, and young adults yes. out there, you should totally go work at camp because let's like like the nags were saying, that's just one story. There oh, are yes. billions of stories that happen every summer that are hilarious. Well, the other reason we wanted to get you on here is because we just want you to be able to tell people. Let's talk, please, for a quick moment about uh, morning discovery, Christmas discovery, kids five all that stuff. Uh, folks out there, if you are not aware of these things, the, the Captain's Nag are actually absolutely knocking it out of the park with these videos. They are so professionally done, guys. They are so well done. It's incredible. So um, there are people out there who are, are, are not aware of these videos and what they are. So talk to us, please. How did these get started? How did you have the idea for this? Was this Was this started out of the coronavirus pandemic or is this something you've been working on for a while? Talk to us about this, please. Sure. So obviously youth ministry, we love it. Uh, we've done the camp life a bunch. Um, and one of the hardest things about leaving um, the divisional youth department and coming to THQ is it, it felt like one more uh, step removed from from the thing that we loved, right? Testify. So, yes. <laughs> so um, we, and we, uh, at our camps, the two camps that we were, we were at, um, we always said that Christian education was our program. That's what we did. And everything else that happened day in and day out flowed from Christian education. So uh, morning discovery is actually something that we started um, in our first uh, camp appointment in Massachusetts. Um, and what it was, was morning devotions. Um, but it, morning discovery sounded a little more exciting than morning devotion time, right? So <laughs> right, right. That, that's morning discovery. Um, and what you have seen uh, online throughout the summer um, and at Christmas is literally what we would do at camp um, recorded. Obviously, unfortunately, the the fun part is all of the... Um, uh, competitions that we would have normally in the camp setting, uh, or if we took morning discovery to a, to a core would have been kids participating in those. Uh, but morning discovery came, uh, from camp. And then this summer we were obviously in the spring, we were confronted with uh, coronavirus. It became very clear that our camps were not going to take place. Many of our core um, couldn't do the full program that they were used to doing. And so uh, Morning Discovery happened this year uh, online during the summer and at Christmas, a direct result of uh, the pandemic and a need to bring uh, Christian programming, biblical stories, Bible points, uh, memory verses, and a whole lot of singing and fun into people's homes on their devices. Um, it was just, uh, it came out of an absolute need really. Yeah. I would say that we were trying to do our own version of like Nickelodeon church where it was like something the kids were looking forward to for sure. That the, that the entire staff, everybody on the property who was at camp wanted to be at more discovery. Cause if you missed it, you would miss out on the latest thing taking place. So, one of the big things was like we started off every single church service with secular music, right? Like, like bumping tunes, man. Like things where you could hear all over camp. We were getting calls uh, to the police department because <laughs> it was so loud. You think I'm kidding? We got <clears throat> one summer. I think we got over 35 calls. Anyway, um, 
the, <laughs> we were bumping the music and getting the kids dancing, getting them all hype, and then go right into a worship song. So we started to just, we try to we're trying to teach the kids that you can worship the Lord with all your heart and have a lot of fun doing it and dance and sing and celebrate. And so more discover kind of became like our own kind of challenge, and it also got really cool. So we changed his name to Morning Disco, right? Yep. So. The morning disco really was really fun. And we had all these different elements. And so over the course of, I would say, eight summers, um, we really refri- refined like how we put together our our, um, our worship time together. So it always starts really, really, really hype. And it keeps, it's just a lot of energy, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. And then we go into a focus point where it's clear it's now time to listen. Does that make sense? Sure. And then that would always end with a time of prayer. And then we, we send them out on a big high note, like a theme song that everybody loves and does all the motions to. And then that becomes sort of the soundtrack of the summer. You know, the things that we do in the course of the worship time would be how it went. So then when camps got, were canceled all over to all over the place and all these thousands of kids are displaced and not having places to go and forced to do stuff at home, we felt like we would deliver a little bit of camp biz right to the house through the internet, you know? And so more discovery kind of happened. And really, the, uh, the first nine episodes, I think we shot over the course of four days, and then it just took weeks to edit, like the yeah. amount of stuff that we brought in and had to do, and just had a lot, a lot of fun doing it. And um, the majority of the editing and stuff was done by myself, and I had a little bit of help here and there, but it was pretty much, it was a part of processing, missing camp, missing that social thing, creating something to be excited about every single week. You know, the energy of all of it in our experience, it was like uh, we just couldn't let go of it, frankly. And we had an opportunity to make some big influence. And so, you know, every episode is getting five to 10,000 views. It's awesome. It's just super, super fun. We have a great time and a lot of people contributed. So like the theme song was written by one of our buddies here at the building. And he wrote that, I think, in a day and then had it recorded and back to us, I think, within three days. It was like nobody had anything to do. They were dying to do work. So it kind of like woke up a lot of people. And then we we, we reached out to a few um, speakers that we knew had a special gift. Uh, and an ability to communicate to children and brought them in, got them on, recorded them. And then we recorded some ridiculous games and just made fun of the whole thing. It just, man, it's a super fun thing. And then the kids, the kids five was, we just did five minutes like you would do in a normal worship service and right. they included us in the territorial thing. And Leslie really is the master of those. Um, and I help with like some of the edits and some of the, uh, you know, the graphic stuff and animation that goes into it. But it's a way for us to work as a team. It's a way to minister. And then on a personal note, we actually were able to involve our children in it. So like my daughter, uh, Lily, does some of the memory verses. The kids will dance to the songs that they're doing, you know, in the course of the episodes. Sometimes they dress up and wear beards they made out of construction paper to be part of the, the Bible stories and stuff like that. So it was a fun way to use, you know, use the people in the house and they had to do it because dad said, and it was fun. <laughs> so there was a lot of a lot of stuff mixed up in there, but it was a lot of fun to do. And we that's why we just decided to do a Christmas series because we just didn't want to let it die. You know what I mean? We wanted to still connect. The, such a I have like a list of things that I love about morning disco and Christmas disco like uh, the fact number one that you in, involve people from all over the territory is exciting and just to see kids dancing from you know from this house and this house and you stitch it all together that's awesome Two, the shirts everybody gets like a shirt which is awesome too yeah. and then I really have to tell everybody all our listeners out there if you want to see like it's just it's great editing Jay like spectacular professionalism video usually unfortunately and I'm going to come for myself and the Salvation Army here is when we do stuff we usually just have a nice little iPhone on a tripod and we sing and we're good if we get like climb, climb up sunshine mountain or something like that. Great but, <laughs> but, but to, if you guys can see this, um, Jay, Leslie, tell people that, well, here's, here's a follow-up question to that. Where do you go next now that Christmas is over? Where do you go next with these videos? And then tell people, how can they find these things by now? They want to see them. How can they get there to them? Sure. So um, to find them, I can answer that one easily. Go to booth youth, B-O-O-T-H, youth.com. And right there, you'll find a link to uh, Morning Discovery. There you'll find a link uh, for Kids 5. Um, Where do we go from here? You are asking the $10,000 question uh, because we've kind of gone back and forth uh, about what we're going to do. Um, And I really think at this point, 
this stretched our department. Um, we're a, a smaller department, and um, so it, it really stretched what we could do. I think at this point, um, if the as the pandemic continues, uh, we'll make some decisions about whether or not we will do it or can do it in the summer. If things start to normalize, if you will, um, we would have to probably bring another person into our department. And I feel like our finance department's not feeling that at the moment. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, but we, we just are put, you, we it. just put pressure on the finance department. That's right. That's right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I Listen, think Matt, we're still talking about it, to be honest with you. Um, we did it in, like, like we said before, we did it to fill a void because the camps are closed. You know what I mean? Right. And really, the, the whole thing works much better when you're standing in front of, you know, a couple hundred kids. I mean, that's where the fun is. And uh, one of the things that doesn't translate all the way through is some of our favorite parts of the camp ministry, which is when we have a chance to pray with the kids and the staff. And so we do miss that thing. And we would prefer that the focus and energy will go towards enabling that to happen in person at the different places. But who knows? I mean, they're a lot of fun. I know, I know for uh, commissioning, I don't know if I'm letting that cat out of the bag here, but like for commissioning, we have a couple special episodes planned so that the kids have their own kind of thing going on that weekend. Um, and those are going to be outrageous. The ideas for that are even, it's going to be even funnier and louder and more, you know, more crazy uh, <laughs> yeah. based on the plans for that. Uh, but maybe we'll come back Christmas. Maybe we'll come back and do a couple this summer. It really depends on how, how in person we are this summer. You know what I mean? To do that. And, but it does take a lot of time, like Leslie says, and we love doing it and we've learned a lot of things from it. Um, and I'm just, I'm still overwhelmed by the thousands and thousands of views that we've seen. You know, we would do, we would put a, the same amount of time into our live morning discoveries at camp every single day. You know, we would do like 28 of them over the course of the summer. We would put that much time into every episode, but we only, only the 200 kids that were there or the 300 kids that were there saw it. You know, now with the internet, with YouTube, with Facebook and the way people share things, you know, within one day, over a thousand views, clicks, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then as it, as it builds steam and as something funny happens and people start laughing about it, you know, more and more people catch on. It's hard to think that we would want to stop that kind of opportunity for influence. For sure. You know? for so sure. if anything, that becomes the new frontier that we've learned from here is that we're not just going to, we want to do live events for sure, but do we need to think about a way so that these things can make it get into the hands of where young people are meeting? And frankly, they're meeting online. And we have to get to those places so that they can hear the truth of the gospel, the hope that comes from knowing Jesus. And they have an opportunity to, uh, to find salvation, to find love, to find forgiveness, to find identity, you know, in Christ. So that's really where our heart is. Yeah, that's so good. Has Matt told you the story about how he got busted watching Morning Discovery at the office? No, it was, commander. <laughs> it was one of, it was, we had just gotten this appointment and, um, yeah, we uh, hadn't been in very long at all. And the national commanders, commissioners, Kenneth and Jolene Hodder had literally only been there like two days. We had <laughs> met them briefly one time. <laughs> so yeah. I, I saw your, your stuff on Facebook about it. So I'm watching you live on the, as it, as it's running live one day, just sitting there. And I was like blown away. He was into it. He clapping was very my hands, it. <laughs> like just being that guy. And then, you know how, when people come into your office and you can just feel that people are in your office. Yes. So I turned around and it was uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Jolene Hunter. Hodder and Commissioner, no, sorry, Colonel Paula Johnson. You guys uh -huh. know her, yes. of course, who were just silently standing there and behind watching me act a fool in my office. <laughs> to morning discovery. That's awesome. Yeah. So now yeah. my office okay. desk is turned away from the front door. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Quick lesson learned. <laughs> yeah, so I think people come to expect it from the youth department, though, right? That's They're like, right. Oh, it's the youth Absolutely. Guys. It's normal there, right? <laughs> Yeah. So listen, so knowing your heart, and again, we could just hear it coming from, from everything that, that you just said. Um, tell us a little bit about like, what, what is on your heart? What are you concerned about um, with, with this generation uh, growing, growing in faith um, with the things that are facing them? What, what is like your biggest concern in youth ministry? You know, I think, um, and I don't know if this is particular to this generation. I feel like my heart for my own children 
and for the children that I find myself around, whether it be at the core, uh, at an event, um, my heart would be that they would have their own faith. Um, I think for me growing up, um, I, I know that a lot of times I sort of leaned on the fact that my, well, my mom is, my mom knows and loves the Lord. My mom's a good Christian. That must mean that I am. Um, and I, my heart for my own kids and, and the kids that I come in contact with would be that they own their own walk with Jesus, that they would, uh, be able to, um, that they would know his word. Um, and I think my heart would be that they, um, would be faithful to who he has called them to be and to not, not shrink back. I think that's my, my concern. We live in a world where, um, anything goes right now. And actually the, if, if the crazier I can be, the more, the more different I can be, the better it is. Um, and I think that I, my heart is that we could be crazy for Christ and not be afraid or ashamed or shrink back. That would be, I think, my heart uh, for the youth that I come in contact with. I, I really feel that um, that influence is a big word right now. I think that there are a lot of things that are influencing um, our young people and they're berated from a lot of different directions and not all of those things are positive. Um, and when I say positive, I mean what honor the Lord. And I think that that is a scary thing. You know, I think about the way my kids have to go into, you know, public school or go into different places like that. There's an opportunity for influence all the time. And as a parent, like I want my kids to be influenced by people who are, you know, positioned in a way that'll, that'll help and add to their life. You know what I mean? Um, but for, for us, I think that my heart is, is that we would find a way right now to have a heart for this generation, to influence them towards uh, loving Jesus and the truth of his love, the truth of his, um, you know, his, his death on the cross and how it, his, his sacrifice for us gave us, gives us eternal life. But it's a choice that we have to make, like Leslie said. It's an individual choice. You know, I remember when we were going into training, like they were like, oh, wow, you're like a fifth generation salvationist, which means that like uh, the people that were born before me were, you know, part of the army and stuff like that. And I kind of resisted the label of that multi-generational thing because my relationship with Christ is my own. Like it's me. You know what I mean? And not to dismiss what, what's happened in their, their situation or how they've been faithful or how I led to, you know, was led to the Salvation Army, led to the Lord, but just that we want to claim this individual relationship with Christ, that he cares about us as individuals. You know what I mean? That we matter, that we come to Jesus one at a time. And we firmly believe that he is the way, the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. There's a bazillion ways to get to Jesus, but only Jesus leads to the Father. That's what we believe in. So we want to influence people towards, you know, loving and and, uh, and sharing, you know, the, the life that comes from a joyful existence with Christ. And we want people to not just keep it to themselves, but to share it. And we love creating spaces where people can really take a moment to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to them and then have a chance to respond. That's that's what we're hoping to do every chance we get around anybody. That's excellent. Excellent yeah, stuff, guys. It does, and it, it really resonates. You know, it all the stuff like you're – like what you what you said, Leslie, with your your parents' faith, and even you, Jay, with your with the generational history, all those things are important because they help shape who you are. But at the end of the day, that only gets you to the starting point uh, of, of of your relationship with Jesus. After that, like you, it's it's on you, and you're responsible for that uh, that making that choice and making those decisions and your own personal holiness. And so, um, I hear you, and I feel you, and I share share your hearts on that. I'm gonna. Uh put you on the spot a little bit here too, in that like one of the reasons we started this, this podcast was to have conversations about where faith, culture, community all kind of meet up. And most recently we've seen it just in the news the last couple of days with stuff going on that, that people say like the church, especially with the next generation coming up behind us has been silent on issues that we should have talked about. So are there, in your opinion, are there areas in the culture that you think perhaps the church 
not just the army, but the church in general has shied away from and um, that we should be addressing, that we should be speaking redemptively into. And then in the same vein is that, again, there are people out here who don't really know the Eastern territory. Um, Is there like things unique to the Eastern part of the United States that um, perhaps you could speak into as well that like, I mean, I know like if, if some issues are nationally and, and globally that, and that's cool. But if you think of anything too, that maybe you guys have to deal with perhaps in the Eastern United States that perhaps, you know, somebody in, uh, you know, West Texas isn't even thinking about. Sure. Well, for the first piece uh, with culture and the church, um, I think we're, we've been seeing it with COVID, right? Talking about online content um, for so long. I think that um, we've just been told, you know, the internet is bad. I think particularly youth. Um, and, and certainly we have to be very cautious and careful uh, with what our kids are seeing and doing and how they're using their time online. Um, but I also do think for the church, and I'm going to speak very specifically about the Salvation Army, um, I think that we have, we have not, we've had, we're so busy with all of the stuff that we're doing in the Salvation Army to sort of add another component of online ministry um, is very difficult. But I'll be honest with you, like my kids and in my own house, um, they are watching YouTube. They are watching, they're watching other people play video games. They're do. it's just so, it's so crazy. And, it, and for my 42 year old mind, like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but the reality is, is that is where they are. And if we want to reach kids, we need to be where they are. Right. So I do feel like moving forward, um, We have to be willing to have more online content, whether it is more morning discovery-esque type things, uh, stuff for young adults, stuff for teenagers. We just, we have to be willing uh, to look at uh, online content and how we can uh, have fun um, and introduce people to Jesus while doing it. Um, and so for me right now, that's kind of where uh, our headspace is. We are in our department right now. We have a couple of people working on, we haven't even told our territory yet because we haven't, we haven't really put it out there yet, but we've been working on uh, some TikToks that are sort of our um, troop related, character building programs related. So yeah, so there's, uh, right now we have a few on, um, like on art and colors. Um, so we're working on that right now. Like I said, we haven't even, nobody knows about it. Um, and they are up and live. Um, but we're trying to get a library ready before we really kind of go live with it. But it, we need those kinds of things. Um, and we need people to see uh, uh, a, d- a deeper, different side to who the Salvation Army is. Um because we are we are multifaceted, so I would say that um, is is what I'm thinking of. Uh, the next piece, you say something that maybe is different about the Eastern Territory. The the top thing that comes to my mind at the moment, um, and it's sort of pocketed throughout the Eastern Territory, is we have a program called uh, BTG, Bridging the Gap, um, and it's bridging the gap it, it is a program that is bridging kids who have maybe been first time offenders, simple um, offenses. Um, The Salvation Army has a program that is trying to show them a different way, Uh, partnering with uh, other agencies and uh, uh, other churches, um, getting kids uh, resources to help them to not fall into a life uh, that leads only to uh, the criminal justice system. So uh, we have some really successful programs uh, in the Eastern Territory, uh, bridging the gap um, for our kids and helping them to be good community members, leading a, a, a huge piece of that is not just teaching them to be good community members, but also uh, introducing them to Jesus. Uh, so there has been some great stuff that's happening in the territory. As I say, it's in pockets. It's not, you know, everybody doesn't have a bridging the gap program, uh, but it is something I would say is probably a little more unique to our territory. Um, that's been a very, um, it's been a, a very good program um, in locations uh, throughout our territory. 
that's really exciting to hear. I think you're right. I think that is pretty unique is that we don't have anything or we didn't have anything like that uh, where we were in the South. Mm -hmm. um, certainly probably have a large need for it. So I would yeah. be uh, curious to hear more about that. And I think you're so right about like our opportunities online. One of my fears, uh, not fear really, but I guess kind of looking at the army and thinking, how can we adjust being the size that we are is both good and bad. Yeah. Right. It's good. Cause we, ha we do have opportunities and resources and capabilities to do this, but at the same time, getting an organization this size to shift or turn <laughs> yes. sometimes, sometimes takes quite a long time. And then it often seems like by the time we do make the shift, we're off to the next thing and we're That's in trouble right. again. That's right. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, um, this online piece, honestly, truly, um, if we had like another person in our department who could really help us with this, I really do think that we, we could do something with it. Um, but right now where we're at, we're doing the best that we can, but I do think, uh, we have to look at moving forward and, uh, how we can really meet, uh, needs of these kids who are already online. They're already checking stuff out. Let's give them something, um, uh, that's going to bring life uh, and change the lives of families, frankly. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a couple episodes ago, I tried to get Hobby Lobby to uh, advertise on the show. So Hobby Lobby, if you're listening, why don't you, <laughs> you hook up the Eastern Territory Youth Department with uh, gospel -centric that's right. position. <laughs> uh, tell them out. J J, do you have anything else that you want to add to that? I really think that the, uh, the the influence were to go back to that and how we can use the internet to, to the, do those things is really where our hearts at are today. That we're seeing like, um, you know, in the, in the line of work that we've been in for the last 10 years, it's pretty much been a, a very event focused thing or camp focused thing, or how do we support the individual communities where cores are located? And, you know, we're trying to influence leaders to influence, you know, the children and the families they're working with. And I think the Internet, the reach of it is so, so vast and so strong, so strong that it's an opportunity for us to help mobilize and draw people out who have the same thoughts as we do about helping one another. And so for me, that's it. I mean, it's about drawing people out and calling people into action. Um, and the Internet is the place. It is the town hall of you know, these communities. And really, that's that's communities is what is what it's about. If we can activate individuals in their communities and they can find other individuals who are excited about the same things. The Lord says that whenever two or three are gathered in my name, that he's going to be there. So if we can get people to work together, that something cool is going to take place in each of those neighborhoods. And as the neighborhoods and stuff draw together and support one another, and as bodies of faith come together, I mean, the message of the Salvation Army comes from the gospel. And it's about telling the world about who Jesus is and the truth of who Jesus is. So what we want to do is we want to influence, yeah, by using the Internet so that individuals will activate in their communities and that community by community, person by person, there'll be change taking all over this entire country, all over this entire you know hemisphere, all over the entire world. You know, and so we're, we, it's our turn. It's our turn right now in this time to get out there and start yelling and screaming at the top of our lungs about the wonderful, gentle, gracious love of Jesus. And the Internet becomes our street corner, like our right. like Excellent. our open air, Excellent. like our the Internet becomes a place where we can put things out there and say to people, fine, you don't like this. There's a way to respond. Here's a way to respond and help them and understand and educate and draw them to Scripture. And that's the kind of things that we have to start imagining. The live event is essential, no, no doubt. I mean, with what we do, that's what we do a lot of stuff. But we have to think about in terms of how that can have a larger play out, how we can leave those things um, up on the Internet so people can go back and watch them again, how they can be segmented into segments that are so special and so God anointed that it continues to reverberate, you know, through time, that people can go back and watch it over and over and over again and make it accessible do you know what I'm saying? I think there's just a value to that. I think that the internet makes those moments last longer, that they have a different sort of, um, they have a different life. You know, I remember as a kid, my dad said to me, Hey Jay, do you think that your prayers ever expire? Like, do your prayers just like vanish? And it made me really think about the way that God hears us and the way that God interacts with people. Even as a kid, I was like, Whoa, holy cow, man, like what I asked for, he's really paying attention to. And so as I've gotten older and I understand exactly what that means, I, you know, I just think that these prayers and these Holy Spirit moments where God moves 
We need reminders around us. My kids have the deepest memories of vacations that we have pictures hanging up of. If we want to, if we go back and tell stories around the whatever, my guess is that we have a picture to remind them of that moment that brings them back into it. And the internet becomes a place to have all of these wonderful Holy Spirit moments filed and accessible so people can see that God is alive and that he's real. And you know what's cool is that somehow, even when I'm watching some of those YouTube videos or sort of segments that have been put back up there, I can feel the community of believers who at the point were live watching that, I can feel the presence of God through that sometimes. Uh, I don't know how we can sort of theology about that, about two or three in that part, but <laughs> I do feel like it is easy to make a connection in that way again. And I just think that we don't want to squander those things. I don't think it has to just kind of be in the wind. I think that we have an opportunity to always have a place to go back and look. If you're going to be confident in your life and in your, in your walk, you have to look back at what's happened before and remember, you know what I mean? And I think it's a way of remembering and also a way of grabbing motivation that will accelerate us forward, you know, so that other young people uh, will come behind us and take on this challenge to tell people about the love of Jesus and we'll keep going generation after generation. So for for me, I'm looking for the Holy Spirit. I'm looking for how the Lord is moving and I'm looking for, see how we can bend to what he's up to. And so this summer we felt like it was more in discovery and we feel like a lot of kids were blessed with it. We got loads of emails and notes and even phone calls from parents who were watching it with their kids you know what I mean? Um, there are lots of kids who would watch the episodes over and over again. And um, in the camp ministry, sometimes we have kids that have different sort of function. And so there were some functional kids who are even autistic who we were trying to plan for in our gatherings. Well, a lot of families have actually reached out to me who have children who are on the spectrum who really have enjoyed the predictability and the fun of the morning discovery experience. So it's going beyond what we expected is my point. And the outreach is bigger than we can expect because we serve a big, big God. And when we honor the Lord and when we do it in his name, he, man, he does something cool. For sure. Well, we're going to, we're getting ready to uh, land the plane here, but again, um, excellent stuff, guys. Listen, for being our first interview, you've set the bar really high. So (laughs) I don't know how we're going to go from here. Um, as we get as we get ready to close out here, what what's your one story that you hold of that kid uh, camp, maybe or a youth ministry? It doesn't have to be a kid, it can be an adult or anything. But what's that one story that just keeps you going and doing what you're doing? Because you know, coronavirus, all this stuff, budgetary issues, like it just gets tiring after a while. But when did you see? What's that one story where you saw that heart get changed by Jesus, and that's just the motivation to just keep getting up every morning and doing it. When we were camp directors, we did this thing called the Jesus theater where um, we would tell the gospel story of creation of how God interacted with people, how Jesus came to the world and died for our sins and how he rose again so that we can, we can have a relationship with God and we can know him personally. And Leslie and I have been a part of altar calls every week at camp over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, over the la- over those nine summers that we were working, we actually witnessed over 10,000 different people come forward and make a decision for the lower Lord campers and staff. And we saw amazing things taking place at these camps. And I was, it was my job at the end of it to lead the altar call. And I, I did the same thing every time. As a matter of fact, we practiced it in orientation. So the staff knew it was coming. I would say pretty much the same thing every time I got up there to say, the Lord loves you. He cares about you. You matter. And then we would pray, Lord, forgive us. Lord, we thank you. Right. And after that would finish, after we go, at, at the counselors would pray with the kids. And of course, they're crying together and, 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 and drawing each other close. And it's just a wonderful Holy Spirit altar call moment. It's unbelievable. I'll never want to forget it. And then after that, I remember one week, I just like felt like I got to say something different here. And I said to the kids, now this is your job. They're all sitting on the, on the stage. All the whole camp is on the stage, if you will, all kind of huddled in these small, small prayer groups. And I said, now it's your turn. You have an assignment. I want you to take your Bible home, show somebody in your house that prayer you prayed, and I want you to tell them what happened here at camp. And so, you know, we we do our normal ending. A couple of days later, I get a phone call from one of our senders. And on a staff break, when you get a phone call from a sender, it's not always positive. It means sometimes yeah. you have to call. it's a, usually a Jaguar cabin act. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> anyway. The person was crying on the phone, which also got me nervous because I want to make sure I'm listening and understanding. (laughs) And they start to tell me this story. 
about this boy who just was at camp a couple of days ago and that who came home with his camp Bible and opened it for his mom and said, mom, I want to show you the prayer that I prayed. And the young boy went through all the scripture that we read in the altar call and then said to his mom, mom, do you want me to pray for you? And the mother prays the prayer right there with her eight-year-old little boy and accepts the Lord again and calls the sender crying like, I can't believe what happened to this kid during this week. He's a different kid. And now I'm different because of the influence. And I've given my heart back and I want to be at the core. And it just, oh man, it's just so cool to see that the trajectory of what we're doing is so much bigger, that God is so in control and that he's everywhere and that he can use an eight-year-old kid to share his story. It's just amazing to me. So that's a story I think about a lot because it's more than just the kids who are making the decision, but they're helping lead others to do other people to the decision. I mean, that's, that's something that'll get you up in the morning and get you all fired up. For sure. Well, listeners, I think we have made a great case uh, here today with the nags about working camp. Definitely. Uh, yes. <laughs> Not only do you get Jaguar cabin fun, uh, also it's just if you have never experienced uh, a summer camp or any camp altar call time, it's probably some of the holiest mom- holiest moments uh, we can be a part of. Also, um, Booth Youth, check it out. Uh, to see all of the uh, morning discovery, Christmas discovery stuff, kids five. And if, uh, I don't know if you have it up in time, uh, Leslie, but if you let us know uh, your tickety talks, shout out to Blue's yes. Clues there. Um, <laughs> we might be able to throw it in the show notes at times. Uh, in time, we can help get the word out about that. All right. Captain Jamie likes to usually close us out uh, here. And so this question is going to be for all five of us. So Elizabeth, get ready. Coming at you too. All right, Captain Jamie, go ahead. Yeah. So one thing that we like to do at the end of every episode is we ask this question, what is giving you joy right now? It helps kind of keep us, uh, you know, all the crazy that's going around kind of gives us a little something positive to focus on. Helps at least me uh, think about what am I thankful for this week? Even the little things, which mine is this week, a super little thing. Uh, so what what is it that is bringing you joy? And Jay and Leslie, we'll let you go first. Sure. So today, uh, what brings me joy, joy is cheat moments, cheat moments. I am trying to lose weight. And so, um, you know, one, one day a week I can have a Reese cup and that chocolatey peanut buttery goodness. Yes. <laughs> That's my joy right there. One, one Reese cup or are you allowed like no, come on, killer. It's a cheap moment. And <laughs> it's one Reese cup. Come on now. <laughs> Listen, I, I want cup. all of the Reese cups. It's one yeah. Reese cup. Yeah. We're a Reese cup family. So we have debates like what, which Reese cup version is the best. Oh no, I can tell you. I can tell you what it there is. There is a right answer. There, there is, is a right, a right answer. answer. And it is always the holiday ones you have to get like yeah. the christmas tree or the, tree, the heart definitely. because they are the freshest the you pumpkin have, is beast it doesn't ma- i feel like it doesn't matter what holiday is you have to get them oh please <laughs> now i'm gonna have to run to cvs and grab a <laughs> and grab a reese cup okay yeah, i'm partial to the easter egg i feel okay. like it's the perfect ratio of chocolate and peanut butter yes so good oh yeah. goodness. let's put that in a a, a podcast future podcast let's write that down <laughs> yeah. we will right. just for we'll half an hour we'll debate which holiday <laughs> Reese's. <laughs> so yeah. how, yeah. how about you, Jay? I would say dinner time. Uh, I know there's a food thing here, but at our house, we've, we have dinner together, you know, since the COVID biz, we've had that going on so much. We've never had so much dinner together. And what we do at the end of every single meal is we do a highlight low light and our kids tell us about their day. You know what I mean? Even if it's a day where we're sort of in the house and we haven't gone very many places, but that brings me joy. Just hearing the kids light up, telling their stories, making us laugh. It often always turns into our youngest just kind of dancing and screaming and running around the house. <laughs> so that's that's something I look forward to every day that just reminds me of how important it is to interact and to hear the stories of the day. I'm going to go uh, with Twitter for me today. I, I know that Twitter is usually the place that you don't go to find joy, <laughs> right. uh, the opposite. But when like just the stuff that's going on in the nation, mm-hmm. um, I enjoy going on Twitter. The la- Anytime there's like a football game or some big news going on, I enjoy going on Twitter and just seeing people make fun of it. And I know that's probably <laughs> flippant, but there's just there's just excellent stuff going on right now with people <laughs> making jokes. I just need, I, maybe I hide my pain. There's some psychological, you know, psychological thing of people out there saying I, I mask 
you know, the truth with humor or whatever, <laughs> I'm sure. But listen, in the world we need, uh, just, I need a good meme every once yeah. in a while, just yeah. to take away. I feel that. You, listen, uh, you must be following better Twitter accounts than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But. Mine are, I don't think mine are as uplifting as yours are. So I'm going to have to scope your feed and see what it is you're, you're looking at. Are you, uh, is Elizabeth, are you still on here, Elizabeth? You want to fire off what gives you, what's giving you joy? I'm ready to fire. So, is it gushers? <laughs> Close. It's a blender. Oh, nice. I never eat fruit, but I got a blender for Christmas and I whipped up a smoothie and I feel so sporty. <laughs> Ready to go. What kind, what kind of fruit did you throw in your first smoothie? I went banana, frozen berries, and acai. Nice. Wow. Acai. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I saw somebody making a peanut butter and jelly smoothie the other day and I was thinking, okay, now that might be a smoothie I could get behind. <laughs> Wait, you can go buy... Uh, see a Kai or whatever you can uh, buy that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that comes in like frozen. Matt, you need to go to the grocery store. Like more. quinoa. I'm gonna let you do that next week. Stop. Quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna send you to the grocery store next week, and you can check it out. <laughs> I just thought I see whatever. I can't say it. I'm from the <laughs> south. I thought that that was just like the granola you throw on the top of a yogurt, and that's no. It's like it. a well. Go ahead, Elizabeth. It, light them up. Well, for, I bought it in bulk on the internet. Um, but it's like a the Costco. Super, you got like a barrel of acai. A random website that's based in Miami, but it's like a super fruit or super food to make you healthy. Wow! That's why I got a blender. <laughs> All right, Captain Jamie, land the plane here. What's giving you joy? All right, here's here's my thing. So the kids got a switch for Christmas, which uh, I. have was like a miracle pulling pulling that off but they we got them super mario deluxe is that what it's called matt super mario deluxe i don't even know the name but it's basically uh, no it's just it's like the mario game you know it it started out on the regular nintendo with a little it looks way better now super nintendo all that stuff so it's just it's it's pretty much like you know you have to work your way through the land um the koopa has taken the princess and all that stuff um and so you have to go go pick her up or whatever which i have some uh objections to now that uh i'm a mom i could i could say some things but when the kids go to bed at night i pull the switch out and i put the mario game in there uh and it is like reliving my childhood so <laughs> it is giving me joy although i will say uh matt and i have learned we cannot play together because he pushes me off the cliff into the lava and it makes me want to punch him ironically <laughs> <laughs> Jamie and I, we've been ministry partners for a long time. We do not work well together. <laughs> yeah, we have decided. No, there could be Elizabeth. There could be no amazing race for Matt and I together. It could not. It could not happen. Jay, we I do heard, not Mario. I heard you mention Mario Kart. Are you a Mario Kart guy? Yeah, I beat my children. Oh my um, gosh, I love Mario, Mario Kart. Kart. There's like, not. There's not better games. I. Uh, I'm. I'm awful to them with it. I. I like. <laughs> I badmouth them. I yell at them. <laughs> When oh we're goodness. playing, I shove them if they if they do something too good. <laughs> I'm not I'm not a good example when it comes to Mario Kart. So they are, no, the, it's the youngest two. They are eight and ten. So that's yeah. he's got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. They still love me. They know I love them. I give them money. They're fine. Yeah. Oh, One of the I'm best. I'm impressed that you guys actually got a switch at Christmas because those yeah. were not easy to come by. No, we had to drive was, to Arkansas. It really was. Oh, stop. <laughs> it really was a miracle. Yeah. It was just one of the things where I just refreshed early in the morning every day, and then I f- just randomly found it and snatched it up nice. as quickly as like. <laughs> nice. And it Jay, sent Matt of, on a crazy goose chase sorry. to get it. Jay, one of the best camp night programs I've ever seen was when uh, a staff officer did uh, Mario Kart as a night program. Yeah. Pedal cars. Camp. It was so. Awesome. It was so good. So good. That's awesome. It was so much fun. Pedal right. cars, though, might be the most dangerous uh, camp activity. Hello, that's the truth. <laughs> I would have well, gone with long parts, but yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we just want to say thank you to uh, Captains Jay and Leslie Nags. Thank you for what you're doing in the Eastern Territory. Again, guys, go check out boothyouth.com. Uh, just look at what like Morning Discovery, uh, Kids 5, Christmas Discovery, just incredible stuff. Thank you for what you guys are doing. Uh, God bless you. And um, 
that's going to end this episode of the Battle Line Podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the Battle Line wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, give us a five star review. We're begging because <laughs> we're not above that. So uh, don't forget to go and follow uh, the Peer website, peermag.org, or follow Peer on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at peer.magazine. And also don't forget to look out for the Fight for Good podcast. So until next time, this has been the Battle Line Podcast. Bye. Bye. And hey, guys, if you are interested at working at camp, um, I know we don't know how the summer is going to go with coronavirus, but there are a lot of Salvage Army camps that are going to happen in person this year. If you are interested at working at camp, it'll change your life. No lie. Go try it out. Peermag.org slash work at camp. Let me give it to you in the official way. So if you want to type it in right now, you can. Peermag.org slash work hyphen at hyphen camp. Check it out. Again, I promise you, go. You get paid, you get to hang out and make a ton of memories and your life will never be the same. Go do it.